Welcome to Saving Europe. I'm the novelist and historian Henry Viner Brooks, and in this series, we're following the lives and travels of two of history's unsung heroes. The decisive leadership shown by the 6th century monk Columbanus and the 20th century statesman Robert Schumann helped rescue Western civilization in two very different dark ages. So, joined by my two sons, I'm on a 4,000 mile, 12 country post Brexit odyssey to find out if these men and these dark ages can teach us anything for today. In this episode, we'll follow the monastic pioneer Columbanus, his loyal Irish band through Metz, Mainz, and Strasbourg. In these cities, and on the mighty Rhine River system, Columbanus will be approaching old enemies, but also meeting old friends and making new ones. We'll find a remarkable architectural survival from the Roman era and get a surprising glimpse of female power among the peoples of the post-Roman world. All this and more, this time on Saving Europe. If you're finding this content helpful, then please return the favour by liking this video, subscribing to the channel, and perhaps even sharing it with a friend. And also, do check out the new book which accompanies this series. Thanks for watching. It's about to cross the beautiful Moselle River. Right, we're just on our way to find a little bit of Merovingian mess. There are not many places that we will see a Merovingian Basilica, but here is one of them next. It's now called the uh, Church of Saint Pierre. Um, turning left here. So yeah, so I'm just interested to see this place. Uh, we're not far now. And while we're at this remarkable architectural survival, I want to dig a little deeper into the life and times of that other remarkable survivor, Columban's nemesis, Queen Brunhilde of Austrasia. This is Metz, and we're looking at a Merovingian basilica, which has probably stood even since Roman times, a very rare survival. This is probably a Roman basilica that was built upon I'd like to give a little ode to a rather remarkable woman who is given a very bad run by Jonas in Columbanus's life. This is Brunhilde. They are of an age, the two of them, both born in 543. This might have been the place where Brunhilde was married 40 years before to great acclaim. Uh, the last of the Roman poets, Venantius Fortunatus, says of her at the wedding as he was present, yes. he's very complimentary, praises her for her modesty and her beauty, her prudence and affability. Well, by this period, there's not much left apart from the prudence. She was uh, of Visigoth extraction, originally from Toledo. Both her and her sister married into the Frankish dynasties, but her sister was murdered by the wicked usurping Fredegund. Fredegund was this uh, legendarily wicked woman who tried to kill her daughter-in-law. She said to her, do you want some of my jewels? Come and have a look in my jewel chest. Daughter-in-law comes over and she uh, looks in and Fredegund grinds the lid down on her and, she, and the woman's only rescued by the servants. So Fredegund has murdered uh, Brunhilde's sister. Then her husband is murdered. Then she survived numerous attempts and the machinations of the Austrasian nobles. And through a lifetime of this, Brunhilde's heart is warped. She had met intrigue with intrigue, murder with murder, extrajudicial kill killings. She had become every inch the monster that her nemesis Fredegund had become. In some ways, she is like the antithesis of Cressida in the great romance, Troilus and Cressida. Cressida, if you remember, if you've read the story, is there at the taking of Troy, and she gives herself to one of the enemy soldiers. She is the woman of pity, full of pity, but with no corresponding virtue, no fortitude. Brunhilde, over the years, is the antithesis. She is the woman who lost all pity, but had buckets of fortitude that can only make you marvel at her resilience. She ruled with a rod of iron. Everybody knew that. The bishops knew that. The bishops were under the thumb 
of the monarchy. The nobles knew that. They tried to kill her. She was hard to kill. She survived and many of them did not. The people knew that she was in control. Even her grandson, Theodoric II, he knew. It just seems that no one had told Columbanus. Two such personalities could not coexist in the same kingdom. And the rest of the story we know. In round one of the contest, Columbanus is arrested but escapes prison in Besancon and sets free some fellow prisoners. In round two, Brunhild succeeds in having all the Irishmen extradited, but again they escape at Nantes. And now, as they are entering her family territories again, in effect by the back door, the question that must have haunted the foot-weary band was, would this be round three? And the answer to that is no. Round three would come, but it would not be here, in Metz. Columbanus comes after his exile from Luxoy. He comes here to the court of Theodbert II. It was here that he is going to receive lots of good news. Number one, Theodobert II says, yeah, I'll help you out. I want you to go to Brigantia. I want you to establish on the Swabian Sea, what we call the Bowdoin Sea or Lake Constance. I want you to have, form a monastery there and teach the Swabians. It was here also that uh, Columbanus's friends come, probably led by uh, Eustasius, whose uncle was the Bishop of Langres, who is now, Eustasius is now the Abbot of Luxoy in Columban's absence. He comes, he comes with Atala. He comes here with uh, Chagnold. That was Columban's faithful servant, the one who used to go into the mountains with him and, and wait upon him. The one whose father had given them hospitality Chagnold and Chagneric, they'd given hospitality to Columban in his exile. And now they're all here on the Moselle River in the great city of Metz. I think if uh, Columbanus was looking for that support after that dark night of the soul, remember the letter from Nantes, I think Metz was the place of healing for him. And Columbanus is given this new commission, this new impetus. He will be supplied with a rowing party that will take him 300 kilometers up the mighty Rhine. And there is the next chapter of his story. One step from Italy, from his final destination. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna follow him to the Schwabian Sea. Jonas picks up the next part of the story at Maguntiarchum, modern Mainz where Columbanus' royal escort are unable to procure food for this pioneering expedition. And then that's a problem, because they're out of supplies. So Columbanus tells them, rather mysteriously, let me go for a short time to my friend. What friend? They think he's never been here before. Well, Columbanus goes straight to the church. As Jonas says, he threw himself on the pavement and in a long prayer sought the protection of God, the source of all mercy. And it is then that a bishop, who afterwards testifies that he was acting under a divine prompt, visits the church and seeing the prostrate pilgrim says, if you need food, go to my house and take what you need. And so they load up the boat and continue upriver. But before we leave Mainz, and because this episode has a special focus on women who achieved great agency in the medieval era, it's worth highlighting Hildegard, who founded a startup just round the bend at Bingen. She was a mystic and visionary thought leader, much in the line of Catherine of Siena and Julian of Norwich, but she was also more. She was a monastic founder. She was an abbess like Bridget of Kildare and Hilda of Whitby, but again, she was more. Hildegard was a writer, a composer, a philosopher, and one of the most outstanding polymaths of the Middle Ages. She's also one of the best known composers of Sacred Monophony, which you are now listening to. And she is even considered by many to be the founder of scientific natural history in Germany. In contrast to Fredegund and Brunhilde, women like Hildegard, as women, were able to bring something genuinely new, beneficial, creative, and rich into Western culture. 
Of course, these things are never quite clear cut. For one thing, these cultural engines that we call monasteries are works of art and not of nature. Artificial environments in less than ideal situations, staffed by flawed human beings, but all the while straining toward that great ideal. And talking of straining toward an ideal, let us now rejoin Columbanus and his crew as they strain against the oars on the mighty Rhine. Well, we're on the banks of the Rhine. It's very quiet, this uh, ship. I didn't even hear it coming past. These huge barges are going up and down all the time. It's so unusual to us in England because we just don't have it. So behind me, I see four rowers uh, coming down the Rhine. 1400 years ago, uh, other rowers were going the opposite direction, sent from uh, King Theodobert taking Columbanus and his monks upriver, all the way up 300 kilometers. And Columbanus wrote a song. What's interesting is uh, it's a very lusty, lithe, gritty, manly kind of rowing song. And I imagine if the monks were rowing, they'd have enjoyed it. But if Theodobert's uh, soldiers or his escort, these rivermen, hardy, brawny, tawny souls would have enjoyed it too. Low cut in forests, the driven keel passes on the stream. A twin horned Rhine and glides as if anointed on the flood. Then comes a refrain, ho my men, let ringing echo sound our ho! The wind raises their blasts, the dread rain works its woe. But men's ready strength conquers and routs the storm. Ho, my men, let our echo sound our ho! For the clouds yield to endurance and the storms yield. Efforts tame them all, unwearied toil conquers all things. Ho, my men, let ringing echo sound our Ho! Bear and preserve yourselves for favouring fortune. Ye that have suffered worse, to these also God shall give an end. Ho, my men, let ringing echo sound our ho. Thus the hated foe deals as he wearies our hearts, and by ill temptation shakes the inward hearts with rage. Let your mind, my men, recalling Christ, sound ho. Interesting to an Englishman from the Lake District also is that William Wordsworth on a river just near here, just around the corner, he wrote what he called a hymn. And you can see that there is not quite the same grit in it. Let me read this to you. This is Wordsworth. Jesu, bless our slender boat by the current swept along. Loud its threatenings, let them not drown the music of a song. Greet lied thy mercy to implore where these troubled waters roar. Saviour for our warning scene, bleeding on that precious rood, if while through the meadows green gently wound the peaceful flood, we forgot thee, do not thou disregard thy suppliants now. Hither like yon ancient tower, watching over the river's bed, fling the shadow of thy power, else we sleep among the dead. Thou that trodst the billowy sea, shield us in our jeopardy. Guide our bark, among the waves, through the rocks, our passage smooth. Where the whirlpool frets and raves, let thy love its auger soothe. All our hope is placed in thee, miserere domini. Well, that's two poets, 1200 years apart, on the same stretch of water. And one cannot help, or certainly I cannot help, feeling that a large measure of the confidence and vitality of European civilization was already being lost. Wordsworth, that one-time woke social justice revolutionary, has now only pious pleas for his own safety on a leisure cruise. Columbanus, on the other hand, is heedless of mere survival as he ploughs headlong in all weathers toward a divinely ordained purpose. For him, every sinew, every ligament is straining toward that goal and against the great currents of sin and cultural dissipation. And there's one more obvious difference too. In the second line of Wordsworth's poem, we see that his boat, like much else that is fashionable in the secular culture of most ages, is going downstream and very much with the current. 
But enough of poetry and speculative metaphor. Our business lies upstream, and for over 200 miles, Jonas gives us no clue of what adventures befell them. The only glimpses we do get are tantalizingly from local church dedications and from a 9th century biography of Gaul, which tells us that Columbanus went to Strasbourg. So we are uh, crossing the Rhine finally into the city of Strasbourg on a beautiful Sunday morning. Looking forward to uh, being back in Strasbourg after three years. It's a lovely, lovely city. I remember the last time we came, I think it was a Sunday and they had a kind of flea market out all the way through the medieval streets. Well, it's a beautiful sunny Sunday morning in Strasbourg and uh, we've come to the Cathedral of Notre Dame because Colin Barnes is even remembered here in a painting by Edouard von Steinle in the uh, choir. Colin Barnes is uh, pictured with the other monastic founders. It's amazing that Jonas doesn't mention him passing through this great city where the, where the rivers meet, Strasbourg, but uh, he is remembered places like Garibor, where there are many church dedications. So obviously his time here was fruitful. And we know something else about him too, that Columbanus was here long enough to pick up the bones of a young Romano British girl called Aurelia. And that's where we're going next. Now I feel I ought to repeat that I'm not really into relics, and nor can I imagine that Paul or Peter or the New Testament church being involved in such practices, which after all were common among the pagan Greeks. But it does seem to have crept into some churches as early as the second century. So maybe what Strabo records in the ninth century about Columbanus in Strasbourg is true. We're on the uh, Rue Martin Bucher in Strasbourg, and here is a strange tale. We don't get it from uh, Jonas, we get it from Strabo in his life of Gaul. So, let's put it all in context. This is the church of Saint Aurelia. Who was she? She was the companion of a Romano-British princess called Ursula, sent to marry someone on the continent. She doesn't want to go, she's blown off course, she takes it as an act of God. So, Ursula on Aurelia, if the sources are correct, with 11,000 other women go on a march and they're going to go to march to Rome. Unfortunately, it's the time of the Hunnish invasions. Ursula is killed, a lot of the maidens have their heads cut off, but not Aurelia, who dies of a fever here in Strasbourg. There used to be an ancient church where she was buried here. Uh, Martin Bucher had other ideas and it, it was rebuilt in 1524 when he was the pastor here. What does it have to do with us? Strange to say, when Columbanus comes through Strasbourg, according to Strabo in his life of Gaul, he's entrusted with the bones of Aurelia and he takes them all the way to Bregenz where he places them under the altar of the church that they build there on the site of a, a pagan temple. is rather strange, but possibly true. It's hard to know. So we stand on an ancient site. It kind of gives you an idea of the layers and the layers. We're looking, you know, at a much later church, but here was a chapel. It's a slightly raised area. Um, the river just down to our right. So uh, um, some very interesting old building here, I noticed, with a little Romanesque arch on the far side, which uh, tantalizing. And tantalizing is also the right word for the next leg of our journey with Colin Barnes as we follow him into the Jura Mountains of Switzerland and consider an issue that has vexed every parent, every mentor, every entrepreneur and leader since time began, namely that of transmission and succession. In Switzerland we'll get a whole medieval village and abbey to ourselves and we'll explore a hidden hilltop hermitage and discuss the thorny issue of Christianity and power, and we'll even find time to freshen up 
before crossing the Alps to the Schwabian Sea for more cultural and historical delights. All this and more next time on Saving Europe. Remember also that this journey was part of the research for a book which uses the lives of Columbanus and Schumann to explore the unlikely arrival, survival, victory and atrophy of European civilization. Do follow the links below to find out more. Please let us know what you thought of this episode, what you liked, what you didn't, what was new to you. Just start a conversation below in the comment section. And of course, if you found the content helpful, then we're pretty sure you're gonna like this next one suggested here. But also while you're there, don't forget to help us by subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching.